Hi, San Diego. It's really nice to be invited to continue my experience with the San Diego Jewish Film Festival. I was in San Diego about a month ago, which seems like a lifetime ago now that the state of California has instituted the shelter in place order and I hope that you are all home and safe and healthy and that your loved ones are well in this uncertain and frightening time. Um, I'm doing my best to shelter and stay in place and to continue to share my great-grandfather's art story and the Chasing Portraits story. And I know many of you did see the screening of Chasing Portraits when it was in San Diego, but I also know that many of you probably did not and don't really know the story and would like to learn a little bit more. So what I want to do today is, is try to keep this brief because I know that, you know, people don't want to watch super long video footage about um, different stories, but I want to share a little bit of my story to kind of excite you to learn a little bit more. So my great-grandfather was a man named Moshe Ronetsky, or as we say in, in more of an Americanized version, Reinecke. And um, this is a self-portrait, and it was painted in 1936. My great-grandfather was a Warsaw-based artist in the interwar year period, and although not super famous, he was definitely well-known in the Polish-Jewish artistic community in Warsaw in the 1920s and 30s. He is known for painting scenes of the Jewish community, and in fact, you can see over my shoulder, let's see if I can point correctly right there, is one of his paintings in my office in my home. Um, he often painted religious paintings. Um, and so let's see, I'm gonna try to do a little show and tell here of some images that I have. So um, some of his religious works would, um, well, this is a wedding scene and you can kind of see part of it there. Um, and then this would be more like a young man doing his Talmudic study, perhaps, or maybe in the yeshiva. And then this is one of my favorites, the synagogue interior. You can see the purples of the stained glass window. And in fact, one of my favorite childhood memories is sitting in our reform synagogue and looking at the sun setting through the stained glass and, and really just feeling that connection to my great grandfather's artwork, which um, I grew up with in, in my parents' and grandparents' home. So a little bit more about my great grandfather. So he was, like I said, an artist in the 20s and 30s in Warsaw. He lived a rather secular life. Um, but he did paint the, the Jewish community. It was um, a world that he had grown up in, but had kind of partially stepped away from. Um, my dad was born in 1936, and so he was three uh, when the Second World War broke out. And my dad and his parents and grandparents basically all got trapped in Poland. And my dad and his parents managed to live in Warsaw on false papers and to survive the war. My great-grandfather, the artist, um, was eventually deported to, we believe, Majdanek, where he perished. His wife, Perla, survived the war. And this is a picture of Perla. And so Moshe and Perla had a art supply store on Krucha Street in Warsaw. And in the interwar year period, Moshe would go out in the world and paint and Perla would take care of the art supply store, which is mostly what paid the bills for the family. Although it is known that my great grandfather did sell some of his artwork during uh, the interwar year period. We don't really know precisely how many pieces. And so, um, let's see, we fast forward my story a little bit. My, my great grandfather perished in the Holocaust. My dad and his parents at the end of the war, to make a super long story short, 
um, ended up in the Bad Eibling displaced persons camp in Germany. They eventually drove a car to Italy and they lived in Italy until 1949 when um, family in the United States was able to sponsor them and bring them to the US. And um, before they left Italy, so after the war and before they left Italy, my um, great grandmother was able to rescue a small percentage of my great grandfather's original body of work. And we have to back up that story a little bit further. In the early days of the Second World War, my great-grandfather became concerned about protecting his collection of paintings. And so he divided his art into various bundles and hid them in and around the city of Warsaw with people he knew and thought he could trust. Um, and of course, having no idea that the Second World War and the Holocaust were coming and what that involved. Um, and with the thought that eventually when the war was over, whatever that meant, uh, he would collect his paintings and his collection would be whole once again. When he perished and Warsaw suffered significant damage, the family assumed that most of the paintings had been lost. So when Perla discovered a small collection of paintings that had survived in the Praga district, which is um, on the other side of the Wisła River, uh, some of you might be familiar with that part of Warsaw, it's where the zoo is and was, and um, she was able to bring those paintings out of Poland and into Italy and to give them to her son, my Grandpa George. And when Grandpa George and my grandmother and father came to the United States, they brought those paintings with them. And I grew up with those paintings in um, my family home and just always knew that my great-grandfather had been an artist but didn't really understand um, what that meant and who exactly he was. So here's a family photo. And uh, what's important about this, I'm the little kid. Um, I'm sitting on my mom's lap and she's next to my father. And then my father's parents are on the other side. And you can see behind my mother's head is one of my great grandfather's paintings. So I literally grew up with um, my great-grandfather's paintings. In the late 90s, um, my family decided to have the paintings in our possession professionally photographed. And we built a website with the idea of sharing my great-grandfather's art with other people. And then um, <laughs> I often get asked, uh, so if you don't know this, I wrote a book called Chasing Portraits, A Great-Granddaughter's Quest for Her Lost Art Legacy. It was published in 2016 by Penguin Random House. And then I also made a documentary film, which many of you saw at the San Diego Jewish Film Festival um, about a month ago, and it came out. It had its world premiere in Poland in 2018. And so I often get asked which came first, the book or the movie. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a little complicated. They um, were projects that ended up being complementary to one another. So the the book tells the history of my great-grandfather's life story and then also tells of my efforts to find more of my great-grandfather's lost art and my effort to navigate the issue of Holocaust-era art looting restitution issues. And what makes my story particularly unique is that I am acting as a historian rather than as a claimant. In other words, a lot of people who lost valuables in the Second World War, or had them stolen from their families, have fought for their return. Um, and the issues which are far more complicated than I can get into in this video, but which are outlined more in the book, is that it's extremely complicated to be a successful claimant. And so I decided that it could be better served trying to just locate the art and to better understand the history and to rescue the history and the legacy rather than actual the physical paintings. So um, an attorney once told me that while there can't always be legal justice, there can be historical justice. And 
that is what the Chasing Portraits project ultimately is all about, is trying to rescue my great-grandfather's legacy and sharing the story with others and letting people know about the art because every time somebody else learns about the art, then that means the story has grown a little wider and brought my family a little more sense of closure. So um, one of the things that I thought would be kind of fun to do today is to share something with you that not many people get to see. So I told you that um, after my dad and his parents left uh, Bad Eibling in Germany, they went to Italy and that Perla brought um, a surviving bundle of paintings to Italy. And a number of years ago, my dad discovered this box. I guess you can see more that way, but you can read it a little more this way. And what this box is, is it is from, um, I don't know if you could see here, but there's a, a photography, a camera, and it's a photography studio. And in this box is something really unusual that you don't see much anymore. And these are glass plate negatives. In other words, we're all digital these days, but you used to you know, have emulsion film, um, and before that, you printed on glass plates. And in this box are a number, here I'm, I'm very slowly opening, make sure you have the drama of the opening. And in there, there are these pieces of paper, very thin. I'm gonna put it down just to make sure that it's safe while I take this top one out. So part of my project really is to try to find all I can about my great grandfather's last painting so that I can really better understand his body of work because the more paintings that I see, the more I'm able to understand his choices, his subjects. Sometimes he painted the same scene multiple times. Um, and so you can sort of make guesses about why he emphasized certain people or he chose certain colors or he picked different angles. And those things start to tell us um, information that art curators and art historians would really want to know about his body of work. Um, most of the glass plates in this box are pieces that we actually have, but there are a few pieces that we don't have and are missing and that we're looking for. And it's interesting because clearly my grandfather, my grandpa George, had these paintings after the war, but now they are, they're gone and we don't know who has them. So this one, it's a little hard to see, um, but you get, you know, that you can see that there's this painting. And I actually have um, a website page, a blog post about this piece. And um, this particular painting is really fascinating because uh, I posted it a number of years ago and a man in Canada recognized the buildings in the painting and the street because it's one that his father lived on and he helped me to identify the Warsaw buildings and to know a little bit more about what I was looking at. And so um, I'm looking for the painting and if you want to learn more about it, um, the best way is probably to email me elizabeth at chasingportraits.org and I can direct you to the blog post about this particular painting because I posted it a while ago. It might be a little more difficult to find. But that's part of my project is really to crowdsource the search for my great grandfather's art and to try to learn more and to, again, try to share the project out in the world. Um, I'm glancing here. I was asked, I was given a list of a bunch of questions that I might want to talk about and I, I sort of want to wrap up uh, with the last question, which is what are my top five favorite films and or TV shows? And I'm going to answer that a little differently and again I'm going to um, direct you to my website, to my blog. And uh, on there, I have gathered over the years a number of movies and TV shows that address issues of Holocaust era art looting. A lot of people call it Nazi looted art, but the Nazis aren't the only one that did the looting. And so I, I like to use the term Holocaust era looted art. So 
There are shows from everything from uh, West Wing, The Simpsons, and Hogan's Heroes, to uh, Rape of Europa, Monuments Men, and The Woman in Gold, as well as a lot of other movies um, in a similar genre. You might have heard of The Train, which is an older film, and so I think it's really important that the topic has um, made itself known in popular culture and more people are aware of the topic. And again, that's part of rescuing the lost legacy and trying to get a little bit of historical justice, if not necessarily legal justice. So um, I know that with everybody trying to shelter in place, there are um, there's a lot of time to try to find things to do and to, to stay entertained. So if you missed Chasing Portraits at the San Diego Jewish Film Festival, there are a bunch of ways to actually now see it online. It's available on iTunes, Amazon, Ovid TV, and it's also available on Canopy. Canopy is a movie lending service through your library, and that's free. Everywhere else, it's um, there's a small fee. So like on iTunes and Amazon, it's $2.99. And uh, you can, of course, get the book. It's available on Kindle, or if you order it from your favorite local independent bookseller, it's always nice to support the indies. It's also available as an audiobook, and you can do that either through Libro.fm, which would support a local independent bookseller, or you can get it um, through uh, through Audible. Um, and then I guess the last thing is, oh, I'm not, I don't have it right in front of me. Hold on. I'm back. That was really rude of me. I'm sorry, so unprepared. Um, so uh, again, this is the, the, the poster for the film. And what I want to share with you is that I'm on social media. So the best place to find me are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at E Reineke, so E R Y N E C K I. And um, the last thing I want to mention is because um, we are all again at home. If you decide to read the book with your book club and have a virtual meeting or you decide to watch the movie um, and want to have a discussion group, I would be happy to join you as long as you give me enough heads up to dial in onto my calendar at absolutely no charge to join you and to answer your questions that um, might have been percolating today, um, but that I didn't necessarily answer. So again, San Diego, thank you so much for having me. Um, may you all be safe and healthy and find good ways to shelter together. And may we flatten the curve and uh, have a good ending to a bad story at the present moment. Much love to all of you. Bye-bye.